Um, my name is Lan Snell. I'm the Associate Professor in Marketing at Macquarie Business School. Welcome. Good evening. We are broadcasting live from Sydney, Australia. Um, before I introduce our panellists, I'm going to do an official welcome to country um, because we are an Australian provider. I acknowledge the traditional, whoops, here we go. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamatakal clan of the Darak nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Again, a very warm evening. Welcome to um, Macquarie Business School. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, a really interesting topic. We've had so much interest in, in, in this topic tonight. In fact, I'm just trying to figure out how many people. So far, we've got about 120 people participating and dialing into this call. I know, Sophia, that we've had over 1,600, 1,700 people register. What we're going to do is we're going to record this session um, for people who are not able to make it, and so you can pick the, pick the recording up at your own leisure. The other thing I'd like to um, mention is, is that uh, upon entry into the webinar, we've muted everyone, um, but we definitely welcome your comments and questions, and we'll do our very best to get through them. So what I'd like to do now is introduce our panellists to you. I'm going to ask each panel member to do a brief introduction of themselves. Let me start off with Rachel. Rachel. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel. I'm a secondary school teacher. I started my career in WA, um, but for the last couple of years, I've been living and working on a little island just off the southeast coast of Africa called Mauritius. Uh, in January, I moved to Sydney. Uh, now I'm working as a secondary school teacher in a independent school in the inner city. Thank you very much, Rachel. And David. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm a scientist by training. So I did my undergrad in medical biotech before taking up a PhD at University of Sydney, uh, doing medical research uh, primarily into epilepsy. Um, I submitted that um, at the end of February, gave myself one day before starting the global MBA. And I'm currently working in a business role as a project officer uh, for the Westmead Research Hub. Thank you. Thank you, David. And Richard, finally. Hi, I'm Richard Adam. Uh, I'm a professor at the Macquarie Graduate, or oh, no, the Macquarie Business School now. <laughs> and I mustn't get that wrong. Um, and I teach on the GMBA and managing change. So I'm kind of like obsessed with change. I'm also obsessed with tennis. But at the moment, tennis is on hold, but change seems to be quite active. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, David and Rachel. What we're going to do is we're just going to proceed with, a, um, there are three discussion areas that we hope to touch on tonight. We have an hour of your time. I'm pretty sure that we're not going to take up the full hour. We'll just see how the discussion pans out. And if it pans out in a nice way, in an organic way, where we encourage your participation, it may occupy the large percentage of the hour, but hopefully not the full time. The three areas that we'd like to discuss tonight are really, I mean, this whole discussion is about how COVID has impacted and shaped or changed or redefined or reframed how we work and how we learn. Of course, this discussion about the future work narrative has been sort of building up in, as an, an, in its sort of pace and importance and relevance for the past one, two years. But now, bang, with COVID as a forced behavior change, we are all looking at how we work differently, working from home, working remotely, um, with reduced hours for some colleagues or losing their jobs. What does that mean for the gig economy? What does that mean for the la labor landscape? And independent and interdependent to that rather is how we learn. So we're interested in understanding the impact and teasing out some of these issues as to how COVID may be impacting your profession, um, how you're coping with this uncertainty and this, um, we don't know what we don't know. And that's certainly a truth, but this is, this is causing a lot of people to be anxious and fearful about that future and their natural feelings. And also how we are coping uh, and preparing for that unknown state, or that future state. So there are three discussion broad areas that we hope to cover tonight with the help of our panelists. The first thing we're going to do is just provide an upfront framing. Um, for you. Now, this slide comes courtesy of our colleagues at Stanford University. 
and I spent a bit of time there at the design school. And this one slide really resonated with me. And this slide is now a little dated. It's about one and a half years old. So when I say a little dated, one and a half years old is almost quite recent, right? But such is the pace of change that we've witnessed. So there are four key trends um, that Stanford had identified in terms of impacting or um, that landscape of the future, the future of work, the future of learning. I'm just going to touch on these areas. The first one there is what we call lifelong learning. Now this concept has become now mainstream, I think, in, ter in terms of how we describe our ongoing consumption of learning. And this is brought about because of the rapid changes um, that we're seeing across the whole career migration path, if you like. Um, and so right now we're looking at, whereas once we're born as you know, people into the world and we sort of, like, sort of experience that consumption of formal learning at the outset of our, um, our, our lives. And I'm sure Rachel can comment upon this as a teacher herself, but most 80% of our formal education is upfront. Um, you know, um, school, university, and then we work. And we don't really sort of learn in a formal capacity. But now that's sort of being disrupted somewhat. So that front loaded model of education is, um, is what we refer to it, is being re replaced or disrupted by what we call lifelong learning. And so the, the first two quadrants, lifelong learning and also paced education is not or upfront has been changed because of the rapid changes in Korea, the tech disruptions in the labour market has brought about these changes. What I'm referring to here is the, uh, the need to constantly upskill and reskill ourselves. So we, we hear a lot of commentary from leaders such as CEO of IBM, for example, where she referred to the next collar principle. And this is about how you're actually continuing to add to your skill set and developing your capability to adjust in a very new working environment. No longer is it enough to be a, a, a domain expert. That's just not enough to compete in this landscape today, which is really demanding us to work in teams and across different projects. Organisations themselves have really changed. And so that characteristic of that sort of hierarchical make, um, organization silo based is being changed or replaced by more fluid, adaptable um, matrix based organisations that are increasingly team and project based. And so how are we going to compete in that landscape? And that means that we need to constantly upskill ourselves. And the other two sort of um, domains that we're seeing that is emerging, or Stanford has sort of articulated, is the an access flip. And that is really, whereas once learning was on a vertical, so this is now the domain of expertise, we're now looking at developing capabilities across the board. So this is foundational level layers of knowledge. Now, as a business school, Macquarie Business School is very conscious of this capability build. Um, I want to sort of pause here and talk about the differences between skills and capabilities. Um, uh, I, I believe skills is fairly transactional in its meaning, whereas capabilities represents a bundle of skills. And so to me, I think it's more appropriate to talk about capability building because it is more reflective of, of a set of skills, related skills within that capability. So for example, analyzing, that's a, that's a capability set that consists of a number of different skills within the analyzing uh, capability, such as numeracy, such as digital literacy. So they're analytical capabilities. So that's access flip. And then finally, we have this thing called missions, not majors. And I think this is one of my favorite things because I'm very passionate about education. And I'm sure everyone's got their own passions in life. Um, and this passion has, has really placed me to where I am right now. I started my career in management consulting. I really related to people and I really loved working on complex problems with clients. Um, and then when I started my family, I realized that I was really passionate about helping others transform themselves through learning. And so education was a natural segue for me. And so that was my passion in life. So I'm very lucky to be able to work as an academic because it fulfills my passion and my mission in this. Um, I am a Vietnamese refugee and in, in one generation, if I'm able to transform my life, well, by God, I'm at, I, I really want to help other people do the same thing. And so that's my mission in life. That's why I'm here. That's why I exist. 
So this whole quadrant talks about this transformation of people seeking to fulfill their passion in life. So if you imagine people being handcuffed to an organization because of necessity, because they're there, because they have to pay a mortgage, feed the kids, etc. but yet their heart's not in it. They're very jaded with what's going on. They're just disinterested in it. So that levels a disengagement. Um, perhaps it could result in unproduct being unproductive, a whole bunch of things, disengagement all around. So this whole birth of missions, not majors, is um, we can see evidence of this, particularly in the social enterprise sector. With the startups, we know that 80% of new startups coming into the market are really born out of social enterprise, social impact. So this is fulfilling or delivering back a, a service to the community. So all these sort of trends give us some indications and signal what we should be looking out for when we consider this landscape of the future of work and the future of learning. So against that backdrop, let's now return back to those three discussion areas that we talked about earlier. Okay. And I'd really like you guys to send some sort of um, your comments and questions as we proceed. And as I say this, I, my, my computer's <laughs> frozen. So that's okay. Um, we can actually, this is a nice slide to land on at the moment as I engage uh, with our panelists to uh, share their stories on our first discussion area. And that is really all about how COVID has impacted you in your profession at the moment. We have a teacher on the panel, we have a scientist, we have another academic specializing in change management. So who would like to comment first? I'm happy to go. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, I um, finished my PhD and then immediately pivoted uh, to the workplace. Um, I couldn't have chosen a worse time to finish my PhD and try to find a position, um, given that everything that was going on. But um, luckily enough, I was able to find a position, but the anxiety was very real in that I started my position and literally a few days later, um, institutes and universities across the board uh, were putting in hiring freezes. So. Um, it was quite a, quite a scary uh, thought um, that, you know, by a matter of days, I really could have um, missed out on employment. But my role has had to adapt and change quite a bit. So normally uh, my role um, involves very much the, the business side of research. So uh, building up business plans for research facilities, um, helping researchers to apply for government grants and um, foundation grants and things like that. But, um, you know, typically it's a very a face-to-face -face sort of position. Um, whereas, you know, now I've started, I've met maybe over 150 new people in the space of like three weeks, um, but it's all been virtual. So um, it's, it's all about adapting to um, the environment and, and going from there. But um, honestly, during these times, it, it really reaffirms the importance of science and research. Like, as you can tell, uh, I'm, I'm still um, here in the office on a rotational basis. So uh, my colleague will come in one week, I'll come in another. But that's to ensure that the research still keeps going. So the lab that I did my PhD in, uh, for example, is part of a, um, an international consortium to try and come up with new therapies for COVID. So um, it really highlights um, that importance of, of medical research. And also adaptability and in looking ahead, right, and planning for that future state. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah anyone um, who's out there listening who has a career um, in research or academia uh, will be all too familiar <laughs> with uh, that feeling. It's not necessarily um, COVID-induced, but, um, yeah, you're right. Like, it's, it's important to have adaptability at the forefront of your mind and, um, yeah, and take advantage of any opportunities that arise. Yeah. Thank you. Rachel, did you have any comments on that first area of discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, thought I'd, I thought I'd talk about two challenges and one opportunity. Um, so the, the first challenge is something that I think is universal. So my, my current profession is education. As I said, I was, I'm a secondary school teacher. Uh, but I think the COVID crisis has just accelerated something that was already happening where we're starting to see that adaptability or the willingness to learn is trumping experience or years of service when it comes to hiring practices. Um, that in, in all industries, 
the, the ability to continue learning and continue changing and adapt to the environment as it presents itself is the way that people get jobs and retain jobs. Um, now, my industry being secondary education perhaps is a little bit uh, behind the times, a tiny bit, um, compared to other industries. We, we still tend to uh, prefer and, and celebrate and reward experience as opposed to adaptability, perhaps a little bit more than other industries do. But I think that this crisis is uh, forcing us into a new era where uh, that really the, the, the people who will be rewarded are those who, who are generating the most economic output and those are the people who are able to adapt to the new and changing environment so that that's the first challenge that i see and i think that's something that's probably um, across industries as opposed to just in mine the second one um and that i, I have been looking a cup at a couple of the questions and i'm building on from what abdul has put into his question um speaking about pakistan uh one of the particular challenges about uh this crisis that is affecting education in a very real way is uh, those hand-to-mouth economies around the world, the, the developing nations. Um, I, I would classify uh, Mauritius as uh, more developed than it was. Um, it, it's definitely on its way, but we have quite a significant portion of the population who do live hand-to-mouth, whose uh, income and whose education depends on them having daily uh, a daily income coming in. Um, and so the, the, the challenge in that space is how do we take uh, an economy that, and, and a group of students, a group of uh, high school students uh, who might be graduating this year, who suddenly they lose their income, they're not able to attend school. Um, I think this, this challenge is related in some ways to the, the model of education that is provided in those schools, uh, in those countries. Many countries uh, that are in the process of, of developing economically uh, are, have very content-driven education systems. Um, it's very much retain, regurgitate, memorize the content, and then produce it in an exam. Um, whereas the opportunity that we have in education uh, is, is, is to do with that, the, whether the whether we should maintain education as primarily uh, the purpose being to, to take content from the teacher's brain and put it into the student's brain, or whether we should start moving towards a more 21st century model of education. So th this is the opportunity, I think, for many uh, educational institutions around the world. There was a, um, there was a, a book uh, that was produced by Professor Michael Anderson of Sydney University uh, with Dr. Miranda Jefferson. I think it was published in 2017. It's called Transforming Schools. Um, and they put forward the, the, the idea that the primary purpose of education is not just to present content uh, as it seems to be uh, believed to be by, by some institutions around the world, but rather the content is a vehicle for four major things that need to be taught to the students for the 21st century in order to be valuable participants in the global economy. And those are creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical reflection. Um, so I would also add a fifth one to that. I think character is, is a big thing that schools need to teach, the, that kind of integrity and, and, and personhood um, that we seek to instill in our, our citizens. Um, but this, this transition, it's, we have an opportunity here to transition from schools that are content, that that's their purpose, to actually the purpose of schools is to develop the whole person and embed within them these 21st century skills. Um, and more and more people are realizing this, I think, because as schools in Australia have transitioned to online, uh, we're starting to realize that if the only purpose of school is to deliver content, YouTube can do that a lot better than many teachers. <laughs> um, but really the, the purpose of, of, that's only a very small purpose of school. Um, the rest of the purpose of, of education is that creativity, collaboration, communication, critical reflection and character. Um, and that's the stuff that is the challenge to teach uh, online. But I'm hoping that throughout this crisis, we, we will as a community start to recognize the, the great opportunity there is to create incredible people through secondary school and secondary education. Mm. 
I mean, certainly COVID is a forced behaviour change on us and that tech, that the answer is not just a tech-driven response to this, right? And the other thing that I'd like us to remind everyone in this discussion is, is that online delivery should never be in, in place of face-to-face. -face. This is not about one is better than the other. Just in our current circumstances, we are all forced to use technology and interact in a virtual way because, you know, of social isolation and distancing, which is in place globally to try and, and mitigate the spread of the contagion. So um, it's not in place of, it's certainly the preferred mode is, it should be driven by the learner, actually, um, relative to what stage they are in their learning journey. So when I say that, we know that there are nuanced differences between how a child learns and the motivation behind that learning to that of how an adult learns because we're talking about self-directed self behaviour. We're also talking about motivation um, and need and convenience. I'm going to ask Richard to comment on this, please. Oh, you're on mute at the moment, Richard. I've just got to press the right mute button, right? Yes. So it's like we one of the things that a professor does is they feel obliged to make authoritative pronouncements on anything. So I will try and avoid that temptation. Um, one of the most interesting skills is how you control the angle of your camera in a Zoom session. <laughs> is now lying at my feet and you mustn't see him. <laughs> so it's <clears throat> all these little things happen. It's quite interesting is when when you actually see other people on Zoom sessions, it's when their partners go across in the background and you see part of their domestic life that it kind of becomes a bit more fun. But somehow we all feel like we've got to put on a show that we're at work, right? Whereas actually we're all at home in a very different environment. And to be a bit more open about this is, is, is kind of nice. Um, I think one of the problems of being interested in change is that you become a real bore because everything is an issue of change. and and. For me, the thing about COVID is it, it, it's a big transformation affecting everybody. And, and in my life, what is, what is kind of, it's hit me the most is that a slogan keeps coming up in my, in my mind. It's the disease is not the disease, right? The issue about COVID, the impact it has on most people is not actually the disease. It's the consequences of how people respond to the disease. And uh, there's an old Buddhist saying that, you know, we're, when you suffer pain, you're hit by two arrows. The first arrow is the event. The second arrow is your response to that event. And I think what happens if you find yourself as you're responding to COVID, telling all these stories, these narratives about what's going on, the complaints, the, the, the whinging, the horror, the anxieties, the stress. And a big issue from the mindfulness area is that you've got to be, you are not your thoughts. Your, there's the event, then there's your thoughts about the event. And I think one of the things, if we're going to use learning for life and learning in, in, in our, from our experiences, using COVID as, as an opportunity to learn how you manage and cope with change. And one of those issues for me, and I keep pulling myself up, is that when I start complaining or whinging and saying, look, these guys haven't done this, or nobody's done that, or the problem is this, it's my narrative that's making me so stressed. So how do I cope and handle with the narratives that I'm telling in the course of change? And I think that's an important thing for people to look at and take as a learning opportunity. Mm. So thanks, Leon. Indeed, thank you. That how we reframe it is indeed um, how guides us to how we cope it. I'm, I'm just looking through the um, the questions coming in. One of the common threads that are coming across is this issue about how COVID actually impacts the education landscape. So there's there's interesting themes coming up in terms of inequity, um, in terms of accessibility of digital technology, of bandwidth issues, particularly across developing economies. And this is something that we are seeing here in Australia as well. Well, so there is an inequity in terms of pe how people access school kids now are forced to do work from home, um, as is everyone else. So yes, I think that has been uh, an issue. I think that's going to be an exasperated issue across uh, the developing economies. On the other hand, though, there's a great opportunity here for it to be a leveller. And so what I'm talking about here is how forced uh, how COVID has really forced the education model to really rethink and have um, and look at technology in a more way that we can distribute that learning opportunity across um, to other countries that 
perhaps previously hadn't had that opportunity. So here what I'm talking about is a distributed model of education that is enabled by technology. That learning experience is uncompromised, it's unparalleled, it's still going to be a fantastic learning experience in terms of the consumption process of that learning material. I'll go back to a comment that Rachel made earlier about that it's not all about content, it's about how we contextualise the learning. Content is only one aspect of that whole learning process. How we contextualise and apply that learning, that's what makes it stick in other words so yeah i think that's an interesting comment about you know the lack of accessibility from a technology perspective but also represents fantastic opportunities in wide spreading or mainstreaming education opportunities we're seeing that now at macquarie business school as we experiment with different models of education here and so what we what i'm talking about is that learners and students are increasingly looking at different learner learning models, learning options. Uh, not everyone is ready or has the cap capability or capacity to embark on say a four year or three year ma master's program. Um, it may not suit you at that particular time. You may just be interested in a short course. You may be interested in a, just a, a plug and play model just to really keep um, a, a brush up your understanding of a particular area. That's quite a short course, right? And you know there are a number of global leading platforms out there now that are offering a whole plethora of short courses out there but in, if indeed you want to actually uh, dip into that in a further and, and go deeper into that knowledge pool there then you may be looking at an award qualification so universities like schools like everyone else is forced to actually understand what that learning landscape looks like so when you ask the question about how has COVID really impacted on education how we look at and consume education I think it's it's actually a good thing because we're looking at experimenting and really responding to learner needs it's got to be learner driven at the first point first front mm, can um, I, um, yes. I see there's a question that came through a little bit before asking um, if in the new era after the crisis if technology will be a bigger part of education I think that that answers that very well I think we're going to see quite a significant shift away from the traditional in class in the lecture physically in that space now that universities as you said have been forced to transition and schools have been forced to transition to online learning landscapes that are a bit more adaptable to the needs of the individual student. I think that's something that's going to stay. Yeah, I do too. There's another question there that looks that talks about the impact on in the medical sector. You know, David, you might want to comment about this as a scientist, but certainly I can begin this conversation from my perspective. And I'm not in that I'm a health professional. But what I can say is when we're looking at the trends in terms of the spikes of interest, health is no doubt one of those big trends. Health will always be a want. Uh, a need rather, never a want. So we as human beings will always need health services, right? And so this is morphing into really interesting ways as we look at more sustainable options in terms of looking at synthetic proteins for food biosecurity, a whole bunch that's related to health. I mean, David, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, sure. So um, like the medical profession and the health profession um, as it relates to nurses and doctors, um, they're really the heroes in this situation. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, they're going in at the front lines and they're the ones that are taking care of um, people who are unwell and unsick and they're, they're putting their lives um, at risk by doing so. So, but from a medical research um, perspective, we've really seen the world come together um, to really solve these challenges. And it, it's all been backed by um, quite a few philanthropists like Bill Gates, for example, is um, putting enormous capital into trying to develop vaccines and, and things like that. But um, th that's the great thing about the scientific community. When there's a big problem to solve, uh, we're, we're all over it. <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier, the um, consortium that my previous lab um, is a part of is an international one and it has close to 50 members and it's still growing. So um, we're all sharing ideas where it's not you know, keep my idea for myself kind of thing. And like, let me, you know, take, um, you know, take the glory from the discovery. It's all about sharing everything. And you see that online as well um, with pre-print services like bioarchives, for example, anyone can go on there um, and they're publishing, um, it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. So that, that is a limitation, but people are perfectly willing to share amazing discoveries just um, for the uh, benefit of humankind. So it's really positive to see. And yeah, it's something I, I really admire about the profession. 
Yeah, I definitely echo your comments about the real heroes in this whole thing, and that is the frontline health, serv health service workers. So um, I noticed that there's a, a, an excellent question from Jenny about blended learning models. So blended learning models by modules appear to be the future of business schools. Is Macquarie planning to recruit overseas students in remote learning? Before we answer that, question directly let's switch to Richard really to talk about you know preparing ourselves for the future this is that last sort of um, area I mean I'm sort of jumping around a bit but I think it's all interrelated and it's emergent um, according to the questions that are coming through so how does one prepare for the future Richard the uh, um, a secret you know the, I was just uh, while we were while we were talking uh, I was just reflecting you know once you, there are opportunities and dangers with any new technology. Now, what we're doing is we're actually going into people's homes. Now, on the one hand, that's been really quite valuable and interesting. We've, at the GMBA, we've had a number of students on screen on Zoom, and then this little baby crawls up <laughs> and starts grabbing the microphone, and one of the students is desperately trying to shove the baby into the background while everybody else is kind of like you know this is quite good this is okay you can have an environment like this so it's there are actually advantages because people are actually now able to access education that they weren't able to in the past and i think that's great the on the other side it, is there a danger there can be a danger that actually our work is now intruding into our homes we now have to make our homes into an environment that is ready for work and some of us actually have the luxury of having offices and screens and technologies and whatever, and others, others don't. And they don't have the room, they don't have the space. And there's, you know, years ago, there was a book called The Outsourced Self, which was that the modern yuppie actually spends a lot of time getting everybody else to do all those things that they used to do themselves until they're left with practically nothing in the end, just their job, right? So the, the question here is, as, as the, as, our home becomes a site of learning and work. Are there dangers that we'll get sucked up in that to stress that our home life won't be a sanctuary anymore? And I, I think that the, 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 uh, the jury is out, you know, when, in what senses are benefits and what sense there are costs, but to have an open discussion of both in the future, I think is really valuable. Mm. And just to add on to those comments, Richard, you know, what I'm hearing a lot from people in, in this sort of discussion about COVID impacts is this whole thing about some common denominators, you know, it will help us be more resilient. It will help us to, you know, to grow from this. So let's, let's now attempt to define what we actually mean by resilient because in that context of saying oh well, COVID will help us be more resilient and this is like this this superpower um, that we have in terms of our coping mechanism right um, it almost presents the construct of resilience as something to aspire for and you know is the desired end state but is it so if we were to accept that resilience is a construct called a b a so you know the this is the, 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 the current state. Something happens and that intervention, it's called B, okay? So that disrupts A. And then being resilient means that we go back to that position to which we were before the inter intervention, so ABA. Is that necessarily what, what we're striving for or is it indeed growth that we're looking at here? And if resilience is defined as ABA, perhaps we might think about growth as ABA+. Plus. So not going back to where formal state, but going above and beyond that. And I personally believe that we're looking for growth in this because here's one thing that we know for sure. I think we can say this for certain. Post COVID is not going to be what the world was pre COVID because it's going to imp the, the significant impact on us socially and economically has a, a, a long standing effects. And so that, that state of that future is a different state to what we came in on, right? And so therefore in how we construct that is we're looking at growth uh, from that experience. That's how I like to construct it anyway. I'm interested in people's thoughts on that. Um, I guess like, um, like you're saying, um it really um, is perspective shifting. Like you, you, you don't really, um, you know, take um, stock of or gifts, you know, that we're given on a day-to-day -day basis. You know what I mean? Like meeting up with friends or, you know, uh, and doing things like that that we, you know, take for granted and that we enjoy um, have suddenly become, 
so restricted that it's it, it really is a shock to us as humans and you know we really need to make sure that from a from a psychological perspective that um you know similar to richard's point earlier that um, we meet, need to maintain a mindset of being pragmatic about solving our issues, um, but also um, remaining optimistic and recognizing that the effects of this, um, the, the really nasty effects of it uh, will pass. So having that forward thinking mindset, um, I think is really important to make sure, and especially from a psychological perspective, um, because yeah, social isolation, I, I hate that word isolation because it's it's such a bad thing to have to go through for a lot of people. Um, and it's a very real thing that a lot of people are having to go through now. So yeah. it's important to keep that mindset of um, positivity and enthusiasm for the future. Yeah. I agree. And I liked the, uh, sorry, Richard's comments about the, the blurring of work and home life. Um, and I, there's, there's also been a blurring going on of, of job descriptions, I think, in many people's industries that uh, suddenly as, as we've all been forced to perform our roles in very different ways, functioning in very different, on very different platforms, uh, I've found, and I'm sure other people have found as well, that suddenly their, their job description has become a bit porous. And really it's about where is your skill? And if you can do something that someone else can't do, then you suddenly become, you become a teacher, you become an expert, you become someone who has to lead something that before when we weren't in, the, in this space, you, you would never have been given the opportunity to do uh, simply because that skill wasn't necessary. And so I think one of the, the really interesting uh, things is that th this idea of flexibility and adaptability and just being willing to take the initiative to s see a problem and fix a problem is gonna be one of the, the great assets that uh, employees have if you can if you can see something and then fix it if you can use a skill that you have to to take charge of something that no one else knows how to do this is the opportunity to do it yeah in fact i think we're addressing some of the questions that are related coming through so um we, we're reminded of that earlier question regarding blended learning and then another more recent question from nino about what is the most demanded professions or skill sets for the future uh what opportunity so and, and this all relates to this whole how do we prepare ourselves for that future state right and we know um traditionally that in times of recession people do turn to um learning ongoing learning you know, to upskill, reskill themselves and to, to make most of this sort of um, time to do, to do that. We're already seeing that in the spikes of people uh, expressing some interest in some further study options at universities, for example, uh, to prepare themselves for that future state. So I'd like to address that question directly in terms of what those future in-demand skills are. We turn to some of the more commercially uh, available reports because they're a bit more timely on this one. Um, World Economic Forum has released that future state of those demanded skill sets, in-demand skill sets, and they've identified 16 of them. Um, IBM had released another paper just recently as well, and within two years they saw a, a distinct shift in terms of rating higher the more enterprise or soft skills um, set of skills um, as more in demand it for when we're considering the experience tires market. So I'm going to be clear here, what does that look like? That looks like um, what Rachel said earlier, adaptability, agility, critical thinking, communicating, influencing, leading, analyzing. So these capability sets are very much in the fore. And when we look at, and do the test yourself, when you have a look at the job descriptions that are around in the market about um, uh, le leadership positions or whatever, they will be listing those sort of capabilities as core requirements for leading. So yeah, I think when we look at how we prepare ourselves for the future, we take into account of all the comments that our panelists have shared with us, growth mindset, being adaptable, being critical of ourselves, and also investing in our learning capabilities now to develop for that future state. I think that's, I think they're good, um, that's great advice. So Richard, I'm going to come back to you now. I mean, I know, would, would you like to talk specifically about some sort of like change theory on this or any comments about that? And you're on mute again. Yes, we've got a couple of slides and, and uh, people try and put me on mute all the time. It's just, this is the first time I'm doing it, right? <laughs> so, but going back to David's point about socialising, in, in a way, I, what just popped into my head was a lot of us are experiencing anti-social isolation, right? It's like, I don't know about you, you walk along the, 
you walk along the pavement and some people are actually smiling and friendly. Others are kind of like taking an eight, an eight foot berth around you and looking at you with hostility and fear. Oh my goodness, but, I almost got spat on this morning. <laughs> but no, I've just, no, I've just, so it's funny, people are responding very, very differently, you know, and in terms of a skill for the future, being able to respond to when you're under threat and under pressure, to do so in a way that's creative and collaborative is going to be a really important skill. And, and the other positive side I've found is that a lot of people are saying they're spending much more time with, with members of their family that they have, than they have been doing in the past. It's been virtual, but they've been coping in contact with people from other countries and other areas. And I think, did David mention you had 159 people or something you were meeting virtually? So there are all sorts of openings, but it's not kind of determined. It's not that this will be the effect of COVID. It's our ability to adapt in a way that's, that's, that's creative and, and fulfilling opportunities and not to beat ourselves up in the process. I think, you know, as you were mentioning with resilience, everybody has to prove how resilient they are. Well, we're all pretty weak and feeble, right? And one of the most honest open things in a crisis is actually to be much more open to other people and yourself about how you're suffering from these things. Because if you feel like you've got to put on a mask, it's going to be a heavy burden. Mm. That's right. I mean, that human experience is very real, feeling anxious and fearful and, you know, for that future, what does that hold and scared? I think that they're very real feelings that need to be acknowledged and recognised. I agree. Um, was that, that this discussion about this slide before us, Richard? Or just, uh, just to open up, now I'm muted. This is really good. Um, the change challenge. So basically just two very, very quick things. I promise not to pontificate too much as a, as a professor, but when... When people were, we were discussing change and everybody said, yes, change is complex and difficult and hard and stressful and what do we do about it? Yeah, a couple of years ago, I just came up, there's only two images you need to keep in mind. Right? And, and this is kind of like a guide to the way you respond to things like COVID. And the first one is the presence of an iceberg, is that the tip is COVID and technical things and masks and social distancing and what's happening to my job. But underneath that, is changing relationships, identities, anxieties, the politics around it. And quite often we spend most of our time on the tip and not enough on the what's below. And when I looked on uh, iceberg and COVID, the only thing I came up with was a technical iceberg about causes and, and diseases and, and consequences, not the anxiety, the pressure, the politics behind it. So one thing in change I think is just be aware that we tend to concentrate and talk about the tip. We feel more comfortable talking about the rational technical issues, less about the politics, the emotion, the insecurity. And this, the second image is the roller coaster ride, is that uh, I used to talk about the valley of death, but everybody got so depressed about the valley of death and change that I made it into a roller coaster, is that basically most of us want to believe here's a problem like COVID. Here's the rational response. I know how to do it. Let's go out and do it. Whereas actually, change is much more of a roller coaster that, to begin with, you're in denial. You're angry it's happened. You don't believe it's happening. And you have to kind of get into people's minds. You know, it's like in Manly, where I live, we're meant to be in social isolation, but you have groups of 30 people wandering along, along the beach, drinking and having a good time. And you're going, what the hell are you doing? Right, so there's always that phase of just of change of people wanting to live in the old way. Then once people do realize they've got to change, most people go down into some kind of depression. It's like, how long is it going to last? When's it going to continue? How am I going to cope with this? When's the end? There is no end. It's people have promised good things, but they haven't happened yet. So to kind of guide yourself through that that bit in the middle, and then at the other end things will slip back. You know, for a lot of us, COVID may be life-changing, but I imagine a lot of people are just hoping we can go back to the way it was beforehand, rather than actually thinking about the future. So I, th I think just very quickly, the, the change thing is, is keep in mind the iceberg that hits you, that actually it's the things below the surface that are important and take and raise those, and expect the roller coaster to ride. Because the next slide, if you could pop just on the next slide, and then I will be very quick with this. 
Muhammad Ali once said, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. I think most of our organizations and managers float like, float like a bee and sting like a butterfly. Most of us actually just get stuck in old ways of doing things. We don't adapt, we're not fluid. And when it comes to actually doing something, we're not paying enough attention to what we do proactively. So mm. I think one of the things that have changed in COVID is, is to actually create a kind of likeness in, your, in yourself of being able to cope with this, a likeness of thought and heart and touch to, to actually go with the change and learn from it rather than finding ourselves stuck in the tragedy of the fact that things have moved on from, from the past. So mm. I think those, along those lines, thinking along those lines might actually help people in terms of adapting to not just this change, but change in general. Yeah, it certainly would be helpful. But you know, I mean, what do you think about this comment, Richard, that most people hate change and can't deal with change? Well, it's, it's, it's funny, I was just writing on this this morning, and I promise not to go on too long about that. But what the hell is change? Right? <laughs> like, we we can see things changing. We can see changes. But people say they've got an attitude to change. And I don't even know what change is, right? I know that a lot of people hate changes that are being convenient. A lot of people actually don't like the changing nature of the world. I don't know about you, but whenever I look at my, my driver's license, I go, this is the worst picture of me that I've ever seen. 10 years later, I look at my driving license. When I go for the next one, I go, oh God, if only I could look like I did 10 years ago, right? So, so this, this, uh, <clears throat> this ability to to kind of understand that our life is all about changing and changes is really important. What we react to is a mentality of ours that thinks things will stay as they were in the past and that things are going to be uncomfortable. And it's, it's that mentality, I think, is, is, is what needs to shift. Mm. Indeed. What are your thoughts on, on what Richard was talking about, change and the con and conceptualization of change, Rachel or David? Change is always, is always a challenge, particularly for organisations, uh, because that's not just one mind, that's a whole collection of minds. And it's not just, uh, some of them are, are in, invested in, in the vision of an organisation and some of them might be just there because they need to get a paycheck at the end of the day and support their families. Um, and so you, dealing with the organisational change uh, within your business is, is also going to be difficult because we what Richard has been talking about is both the the, the internal workings of an individual's mind um, but for for us as employees and possibly as business leaders as well we need to be thinking about how do we guide a whole group of people towards that um, something that I feel we we probably need to keep uh, a hold of very tightly um, is that idea of empathy and generosity uh, mm. that we're, we're all in uncharted waters at the moment. None of us know where we're going. None of us know exactly where we're headed. Uh, some of us might have a better idea simply because we have a bit more information. Um, but uh, the way that we would wish to be treated is probably the way that we need to treat others. And, and with an awareness and a generosity to people who might be being frustrating um, to, to guide them carefully through this change as well. Yeah. I'd like to bring the discussion back. Uh, we have probably 10 minutes remaining in this, is, in this conversation to the theme of tonight's webinar, and that is understanding the impact of how COVID is affecting our work and, um, you know, and how we learn. I'd like us to now consider ourselves in um, um, blue sky sort of horizon planning. What does that what does that future landscape of work look like? There was a comment here from a question from Victor asking about, you know, is working from home or from remotely going to be that sort of uh, status quo going in the future? How are organisations going to be impacted by this? Um, if I may, I'd like to start this conversation off. I think organisations are significantly impacted and as the whole workforce is working remotely. Perhaps organisations are asking themselves, we had this uh, pre-discussion before we started this broadcast what is work why do people go to offices 
you know, because if we can still get that level of productivity or yield from our workforce working from home or remotely, why are we paying these exorbitant rent fees or lease, leases of offices? What is the notion? What is work? So it really does force us to rethink what work is, because if we can still connect virtually, I mean, why do we have to go to the office? Richard came up with some helpful things as to why he goes to the campus, and that is to submit his expenses. <laughs> but, you know, but let's just entertain that. I'm being, what is actually, what, what, do, what is work? Um, I'm, I'm really glad, Victor, that you asked that question. I'd like, uh, Richard, what, what are your thoughts to that? I was spending too much of my time listening to people's comments or, or reading people's comments. So um, uh, I think the, it's interesting because on the one hand, whenever you get a new technology, a new crisis, everybody says everything is going to change dramatically. And it does, it does cause change and trigger changes, but the changes are actually things that in a way we, we kind of know anyway. There's, there, there were trends beforehand about working from home. Will this exaggerate or increase it? I, I, I think people have begun to be quite surprised about how much they can get done at home. But whether or not that'll actually become something that's sustainable and will live on, I think it probably depends on the depth of the crisis. If people are all asking now, how long is this gonna last? And, and Trump will probably say, two weeks or 10 days and, and then everything will be solved. But for the rest of us, it's a little bit more fuzzy. And, and I, I mean, if, if the social, if social distancing and, and the disease goes on for, for, say, six to nine months, I think there's going to be a, a practically irreversible shift. There's going to be a huge shift towards different ways of purchasing, different ways of working, different ways of relating to people. If, however, the curves go down and in three weeks time, it looks like things like restrictions are getting lifted. I'm not sure about the depth of the change that will actually happen. Mm. That's, that's true. But I tell you one thing that has come to light and even before we experience the depth or shallowness of that curve, and that is the disproportion or the, the, the gendered issues in, in working from home as well. I mean, as a female, and I'd like Rachel to comment, and, and please, I'd, I'd, I'd like um, our participants to comment on this, whether you're male or female. But we do note that there are some disproportionate sort of caring obligations, say, from a female perspective. So if you're working full time, you're also dealing with your work, looking after the kids and ensuring that there's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and morning tea and afternoon tea, and putting the washing at the same time. So, you know, so that burden is still very much there as well and then homeschooling your children um, as they learn from home but so I'd, I'd be interested in people's observations or comments of, uh, as to that how hard that is for females as well mm, it's I, I um, I'm not speaking from my own experience but rather from the experience that I've seen of many of my colleagues uh, who some of whom are in uh, situations where they, they share custody of their children and so suddenly they have to renegotiate that. Uh, many of them are single parents, um, both male and female. And the sudden added burden and added difficulty of having to both earn a wage and entertain and, and keep your children alive <laughs> um, throughout the school day when they have to learn online, that, that, that's an added issue. And proportionally, um, I expect that this affects more women than men, at least in the Australian context, although there is a significant portion of men for whom uh, suddenly having the children at home and having to work at home as well, although they might not, um, although one parent or the other might not be the primary caregiver, we also need to recognise that there are parents who might not be that primary caregiver, but suddenly they're at home with their kids. Uh, they might have two parents at home, but that the kids might not understand that. Um, they know that mum or dad is now at home, whereas they used to be at the office every day. And so that adds another layer of complexity to, to family dynamics. Mm. Mm. David, have you got any comments or thoughts on this? Um, yeah, but just like um, going on what Rachel said, like it's now very much a, a different environment that, uh, you know, um, in the situation of having both parents at home, 
um, children um, have both of those influences now um, at home. And so like I've been in uh, quite a few meetings where the, um, similar to the joke that Richard made earlier, that where the, the children just come up to them and just be like, hey, how are you going? <laughs> but like, I think it also feeds into um, like, you know, this is a side of people that I'm meeting on the job that I never would have seen before uh, if everything was just exactly the same. Um, I'm seeing them in their own homes, um, like where they're comfortable. I'm, I'm meeting people's kids. I'm meeting their dogs. You know, like I, I'm just like things are happening that uh, wouldn't normally happen. And it's, it's um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> I've met a lot of dogs. <laughs> just saying. It, it's, I think nice something, it's a nice insight into people's <laughs> lives. It is. I, I think something else to consider to just talk about your final question. Why would, why would we go to the office? You've got to think about what is the purpose of gathering together? If your organization has no purpose of gathering together specifically, then we'll probably find that we lose that. But organizations like, like schools, particularly for teenagers, where the socialization is a very significant aspect of um, educating young people and particularly um, kindergarten kids, learning how to share and learning how to work together, I, those have to continue. And so those won't change, but there may be other industries where suddenly we realize that gathering together every, every day is not necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be really interesting to see how that changes. But I also think um, touching on what Richard said um, some of that earlier as well, on an individual level, um, a lot of people enjoy the disconnect between work and home. So um, it'll be interesting to see how things are in the future. Um, but uh, I very much still accept, uh, expect people to want to recognise that work is work and that home is a sanctuary where they can relax and spend time with their family and, and things like that. So. Mm. Indeed. So I, I'd like to address one final question that's coming through on, on the chat, and that is from Daniel. And this is about this fundamental issue of trust. So we're talking about working from home and you know, I think Daniel's question mainly talks about how can organisations trust that their employees will do the right thing and not slacken off, right? In Australia, Daniel, you, I don't know if you, you probably won't be familiar with this, but I was listening to a radio segment on Triple J the other day, Royal and HG, and it's an Australian term that they called bludging on the sideline <laughs> and this was the topic of conversation is how do we trust people when we work from home because you know are you actually working or you know tending to the kids or doing it 10 million other things uh, it's an interesting concept right do we trust people so fundamental to that question is is that this assumption that we don't trust people <laughs> um, there's a, a person that I admire very much and um, her name is Rachel Botsman and her research is all about trust. I encourage you to have a look at her work um, because she talks about this whole notion of organisations and their lack of trust essentially in their staff. Um, we're all obsessed with all these metrics, <clears throat> KPIs to measure quantitatively human output in this, you know, so this, this, this desire to sort of quantify what we do is a fundamental question of trust. I've got, I don't have the answers myself, but it is an interesting phenomenon. Another interesting person to read would be Brené Brown. Uh, she puts forward vulnerability from leaders as, as a key factor in developing trust in teams. And so really your, your question, um, Daniel, about how do you trust that your co-workers are doing what they can really that needs to be initiative from the leader of of your team to themselves be vulnerable and seek vulnerability from their teammates or at least that that's what Brené Brown puts forward in her in her books nice one I'm going to wrap up this conversation oh. now oh, I beg your pardon Richard but just just very quickly I, I think the an issue of inequality comes up now my son the other day comes on and goes says you boomers sitting in your three bedroom houses, loving your time at work, whereas here we are, the, genera the new generation, two of us squeezed into a titchy little flat and there's no room to work, right? So there's a, a lot of inequality. And I, I was thinking because a lot of comments of ours have been coming up from around the world, from developing, from developing countries as well, that, you know, what is it to provide education that is online and accessible? We kind of think of it as being what technology can do, but what do we have to do to create a home environment 
for people in different societies and in different cultures that would allow them to take advantage of this. Mm. Now, I haven't seen much on that. I've seen something about how to get the technology to the people kind of thing, but how you set up, give people equal access as citizens to the opportunities of the technology and what that requires in terms of support for people's home life is something I, I think that's an important uh, public issue. Mm, I do too. There's so many barriers here, that's, that's for sure. Um, so I'm conscious of the time there. Um, just referring to the poll that we had asked you, I mean, it's great to see that, that we do have a global representation of people who are participating in this. I think we had a constant number of about 170 people on, on the call, but yet I know that there's a number of people, in fact, 1,600 people who are, come from all around to, um, the parts of the world who would like to tap into the recording as well. I want to thank everyone for their con contribution and, and their comments tonight. Um, there were two major themes that I think that I had sort of written down emerging from the chats and one is this whole impact on education models that are coming through and the second one is is about those health issues and you know obviously work so clearly this has resonated with people in terms of the topic and we'd like to continue the conversation. The next webinar that Macquarie Business School is going to present to you in collaboration with our uh, Faculty of Medicine and Health. We have a hospital and campus um, and this is going to be looking at COVID related and other COVID related issue but this is really specifically going to look at how the importance of clear, concise and compassionate communication when it comes to a health pandemic that is COVID. So we'll have a panel of health experts to comment on, um, on this very issue of clear communications. Now, note that that does tap into this whole generalist set of skills that we we're talking about earlier about what are those in-demand skills for the future as well. So I hope you can join us for that session. We'll give you some more details um, and look out for that in your email. I'd like to thank our panelists, Rachel, David and Richard for giving up your time and sharing your experiences and comments with us tonight. Um, I'd like to thank all the people that participated. We hope you found that informative um, and we're going to bid you good night from Sydney, Australia. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>